recording first. Okay, excellent. Hi, everyone. My name is Stages. I will be your chair for the round. Um, and I'm joined by three other wonderful judges. I would appreciate if you could introduce yourself in the order that you appear on the draw. I don't think David is here yet. Uh, she is I know, call. yeah. I just kind of assumed that you would go fast because I know where David and David are, but I just assumed you would go fast. I don't mind going fast. That's confusing. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I just thought because finalists go first. <laughs> okay, the order in the draw is David goes first, so you can go first. Okay, okay. Thank you for the clarity, Tejas. Hi, everybody. My name is David, gender pronoun to her. I'm going to be a panelist for this round, but just kindly refer to me as panel. All the best for this round. Thanks, Joseph. Hi, I'm Joseph. Happy to be here. Good luck to both teams. Uh, David? Hello, I'm David. Glad to be here again. Um, glad to be there. Good luck. Okay, awesome. Um, in that case, if we could just go down uh, the room and get introductions from all speakers, you are free to disclose um, your pronouns, but that's your completely your choice. However, you are required to disclose your name and speaking position. So on the proposition, could we know who is speaking first? All right, hi, I'm Kasser. I'll be speaking first and also do reply. My pronouns are she, her. Thank you, speaking second. Um, Michelle, my pronouns are also she, her. Thanks, speaking third. My name is Jeremiah and my pronouns are he, her. Thank you so much. On the opposition, speaking first. Hi everyone, my name is Ashwin. Um, I'll be going first and up first and up reply. Preferred pronouns they, them. Uh, PO is in chat for all three of us. Thank you. Speaking Hi. second. Hi, my name is Chandra. I'll be going up too. And finally, third. Hi, I'm Humaid. I'll be going up with. Good luck in Kenya. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, so just before we start, one brief note. Um, is any of the other judges willing to time? I am really quite bad at timing because I take notes on a computer. Yeah, good time. Okay, awesome. So if you could just post one, seven, eight, and eight fifteen in the chat, that would be perfect. Um, okay. Apart from that, before you begin your speech, I would appreciate if you could state your POI preference again, just so it's very clear. If a preference goes unstated, assume POIs go in the chat. In that case, we welcome the first speaker of the proposition to open the debate. All right. Uh, just to confirm, audibility and visibility. All right, great. Let me just set up my timer. I'd appreciate my POIs in the chat or I will flag on my fifth minute. Let me just set mine up. Okay, starting in three, two, one. Panel affirming that this house would ban uh, free to play video games. Three very important points of framing. Firstly, we think this debate is not a debate about how essentially video games are really, really bad. This debate is not about us banning particular video games. This debate is about banning this kind of financial or that monetary kind of service that comes within these video games. This looks like, as per the info slide, the free to play video, uh, video game service. This looks like like um, sort of having costless video games or the ones where you can pay up front. So it's not about that Fortnite is bad or Minecraft is bad. That's not the debate. The debate is about what, when or when particularly can people or when would they actually subscribe to either paying up front or having a costless video game as opposed to actually paying playing three levels of the game and then paint for the later stage, right? But even secondly, it's very important for us to actually look at status quo. We think then the gaming industry is currently expanding. I mean, the gaming industry today is considered an e-sport and we had just a recent tournament in 2021 in Tokyo where the gaming revenue and, you know, it was like in billions of dollars. So we think because of that expansion, it's very important to have this concept because later on when I start talking to you about the kind of significance we would have at the end of the in terms of economic benefit, this context would play a very key role, right? But even secondly, it's also important to note that these games are always developing. So that means that games don't essentially just have one season and that's it. Most games do, but the ones that we're going to be discussing today, we think that they have that longevity and it's very important to preserve that longevity of the game. This looks like Fortnite not only having one season, but 21 seasons that last for a period, a short time period for like 
10 to 12 weeks, right? And the third point of context and really important here, right? The nature of video games essentially is very addictive, right? It's very important for one to for us to understand because of this addictive nature how then do gaming developers and these kind of updates and then free to play actually come into play and become very much unjustified later on in the case but it's also important to understand that that intuition prompt you have when you start playing fortnite and you're only able to access three levels and then you sort of are really psyched about sort of moving to the next level and then suddenly there's that monetary cost that you have to incur well we think that opposition needs to justify is then when you put in let's say 12 hours of hard labor and you're playing those three levels and because you want to advance to level four why then is it justified to start paying that why then don't we just have it as a costless one or on a comparative have an upfront payment which is essentially important and i'll show you why right but then let me tell you what i'm going to be proving in my speech two things firstly why would people sign up to either have an upfront cost for paying this or even costless and i think in our case when we're banning these free-to-play games Games will focus more on having the upfront cost and why essentially it's better. But even secondly, how then do we benefit these gaming developers, right? So for the first point, we think, when you have the free to play games and the way that metric works, as I explained to you, you play three levels before you even are able to upgrade to level four, you have to have a costume upgrade and all those are in real time cash. So you actually have to put your debit card or credit card number and actually incur those costs, right? So in principle, we think then that essential metric is just a marketing strategy, which is morally unjustified. Why? Two levels of analysis. Firstly, we think because you know games can be addictive, you already know that once people get hooked onto the three level and they essentially really like your game, then they will be forced to actually pay for that upgrade to go to level four, right? The reason we think that this is going to be highly unjustified, especially when you have that free to play metric is because at the end of the day, the funny thing becomes that you are forcing or coercing these people to actually upgrade, right? Maybe even if it's indirectly because you're using that addiction that they've got or that kind of utility and satisfaction, the dopamine, if Effect they get from playing those three levels on that per, uh, on that game to essentially force them and coerce them to start playing for updates, right? On a comparative, what do we think happens, right? Because on your side, when you have the free to play, you actually target the rationality of this consumer, and because this what this consumer is actually going through that dopamine effect, because you know com competition and reward is an inherent you humane metric, right? Because of all these things, right? What happens on a comparative when you have actually have to pay upfront why is that essentially going to be much better right but before i move into that comparative and give you those two strings it's important to understand why we care then about the rationality of these players right because understand number one the kind of demographic that we're dealing with is essentially young and even if it expands to people being 40 years old and playing we don't care but the idea is half or even 50 to 60% of the demographic that plays video games is essentially young, right? That means the progressive cost that you need to be upgrading or you, you need to incur in order to play just one season of Fortnite is essentially harmful for that consumer, right? We then tell you it's so much better for you to pay your $3 for 10 levels of Fortnite upfront before you go to level three, get hooked, they use your addiction against you, and then you start paying even if it's $2 moving to the next for an upgrade and actually pay five dollars right so we think then those costs on a progressive level at the end of the day because that consumer is irrational and you know hooked on that game essentially we think then it becomes unjustified right so we think then moving on to the second comparative we think having that upfront pay essentially means that firstly, they don't bait you into your addiction, right? So they don't use your addiction against you. What essentially happens is they give you the demo of the game. They tell you, this is how the game looks like. If you're up for it, go for it. And this is the initial cost. We think that is so much better. And that is so much more principally justified because number one, your addiction is not being used against you. Number two, you are ensuring that the gaming developers get their profit. So this, does, this means that Fortnite will only be profitable if people move from level three to level four. But something like Minecraft is going to be profitable the minute the user starts playing from level one. What are the outcomes of this? I'm going to specify. But before I move on, I'll take that POI shoot. Would you ban companies like Netflix offering free trials before paid subscriptions? 
understand what I've told you that this isn't like something like a trial or stuff like that, right? And even if it is like a trial, what happens in video games is essentially so much different than what happens later on. Because as I told you, that addictive nature of these games essentially hurts these consumers. And what happens then is that metric of baiting and hooking them to actually start playing these video games, but then don't get an opt-out mechanism because then you have that dopamine effect and you so, you know, you still have to go and go to the next level, right? But what happens on a comparative, as I explained earlier, what are the outcomes of that and why are they significantly much better? Firstly, for the consumer, you do not have to incur that progressive cost, which we think because it impedes your rationality, you do not have absolute choice, which is really, really important when it comes down to you actually taking money out of your pocket and spending it on video games, which essentially then later on leads you to, you know, incurring a lot of costs just able to pay, uh, pay uh, play one kind of uh, season, right? So we think then at that particular point, it's better to have an up, upfront payment because number one, you take away that vacuum space of profit and you actually give this developers that profit and you still have longevity of the game. Minecraft until today only has upfront payments and we still have longevity of the game, right? That is an essential and very strategic example because you do not use the addiction against these specific people, but at the end of the day, you're allowing them to play the game and giving them absolute choice as to whether they would like to progress from level one to level two. But even lastly and most importantly, we think the commercialization of the gaming industry, which is going to be extended upon my second speaker, is essentially very, very important. How to propose. Thank you for that speech. We now welcome the first speaker of the opposition. Hi, uh, can I be seen and heard clearly? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so just a reminder, preferred pronouns, they, them, you guys in chat. And uh, my most wholesome memory of prepping for WSDC this year was when Chanidu played us the Minecraft, the Minecraft theme song on his piano and that made who made start crying. That proves to you just how important and meaningful video games are to the lives of the vast majority of people. And we think that getting rid of the free to play model restricts a large proportion of people from ever being able to access the happiness, the joy and the friendships that video games provide. That is why we oppose. I want to make it clear that this, we agree with them that the scale of this industry is massive and growing with billions of dollars being poured in and hundreds of thousands of people employed. But I also want to make it clear that the vast, vast majority of video games in the modern day are via the free to play model. Companies like Tencent, Blizzard, Ubisoft and Epic Games that make games like Fortnite, like Team Fortress, not Team Fortress, uh, yes, Team Fortress, make games like uh, Dota, for example, all of these games are ones that are free to play, that are the biggest forms of gaming in the modern day. And these are the ones that the vast majority of people depend on for their employment. People who work in games development, people who play these games professionally, people who stream these games on platforms like Twitch. On proposition, this is a new policy that they have to implement on current games, which means that on their side of the world, games that you were playing for fee before, now you have to pay a high amount for. In contrast, our counter model is one where we allow free to play games to exist. We do not ban them, but we impose regulations on forms of games or factors within games that we consider to be bad. This already exists in the EU, for example, where they placed a ban on the loot box system in the game Overwatch. The reason why this is likely is that we are just extending pre-existing regulations on online gambling and cross-applying them to gaming without banning the game itself. Very quickly then on characterization, what is it that people pay for on our side and why do they pay for it? 
the reason that, that people, so on our side, people don't pay for initial access. They pay for two kinds of things. The first is cosmetic purchases purely for clout and a marker of dedication, highly valuable collectibles. So things like skins for your guns, capes in Minecraft, for example. So Minecraft isn't actually a fully upfront game. There are ways in, and there are mods of Minecraft that you play for free, and then you need to pay for things later on down the line. The second is things like competitive advantage, which is where you are able to pay for certain things like boosts. We think here there's already a checking mechanism in status quo, where there is an incentive to make sure that if players work hard enough, they are able to access it already. For example, in Clash of Clans, you can earn gems by paying money, but you can also earn them by mining in game. The reason for this is that there's a huge stigma about games becoming pay to win and people moving away. We saw this with the game Halo Infinite, for example, that relied too much on people having to buy lots and lots of stuff in order to progress, and therefore people just stopped playing the games. There's an incentive against that. Before my arguments, I want to very quickly deal with their argumentation on uh, addiction. The first thing here is that this is not a motion they implement from the start of time. They make it much worse for addicted people because those same people who are addicted on their side of the house now have to pay even more because they now have to pay the upfront cost of this game that's now been compounded. But second, a lot of other media has the same effect. For example, Netflix and free trials. We don't think that this is a form of coercion. In fact, we think that their side is more coercive because by their own logic, you would not be able to provide someone with a taster of a good or a game because that acts as a form of addiction. We think it is actually a less valid choice on their side of the house because you have less information about the game that you are buying and therefore it is comparatively more unjust. On the same basis, you would also have to ban games entirely because when you play one game, you get addicted to the process of gaming and thus that compounds your cost in buying other games, for example. We don't think this logic really stands in this debate and isn't what this debate is about. Even at its best case, we can prove much worse harms. Before my arguments, I'll take a point. All right, so you talk about the kind of information or the lack thereof because you're actually putting them on upfront cost. Don't you think there's so many other avenues like YouTube reviews, live streaming applications that would still give you the best quality of the game and you know what you're paying for? Uh, no, because the point is that you give them less information or else you didn't deal with the point that you force the same addicted people to take on a higher cost. First argument as to why this hurts the gaming economy. The reason why this is important is that the esports and gaming industry is a multi billion dollar industry that hundreds of thousands of people are dependent on. First level of this argument that you hurt games developers. Games development is very expensive because there are high startup and maintenance costs. Maintaining servers, graphics, paying developers, etc. And the market is extremely saturated with a high number of developers. This means that the other two possible models are unprofitable. Totally free games are unprofitable because there is no income whatsoever. And pay to play is unsustainable because it requires users to make a speculative benefit. For example, in FIFA, you can only play as Barcelona versus Madrid in a demo. You do not know whether that is the full extent of the game. The impact of this policy is thus that you hurt smaller games developers who rely on free to play as a way to make a brand name for themselves. Small developers like Valve that had to rely on Team Fortress True, which was a free to play game, who were then able to create a brand name for themselves that allowed them to enter the market and create games like Half-Life. On their side of the house, they limit job opportunities for many people. But even if that is not true, what happens when you are less profitable is that inevitably these companies are going to start having to get rid of their bottom line. This means that even if you keep having the same number of games, you'll fire a large number of people that work specifically on free-to-play games. Second level of this argument is that you hurt esports leagues. The majority of esports economy is based on free to play games because these games are the most competitive because they are the most easily accessible. PUBG in India and Valorant in Korea, for example. These can't be costless because they are high quality and require a large amount of investment. People thus are dependent on these games for their livelihoods. Game developers who spend their entire lives creating these games. Professional players for whom this is their only source of income. Streamers who rely on streaming these games online in order to get money. All of these people go out of a job and likely won't be able to switch on their side of the house. Developers can't switch because the 
because of the transferable skills really aren't there to other forms of coding. Having to switch between a free-to-play game to another form of game is different because of the way the code works. The second is that professional players can't switch because in terms of the sports skills that you learn, they're not really transferable. The reason that all of this is true is because when you ban free-to-play games, you increase the you increase the barriers to access, making it much worse for a large number of people in terms of entering the market and therefore hurting this esports. A uh, second argument then as to why you worsen the outcomes for people who want to play games. The first level of this argument is why gaming is a legitimate pursuit. This is because it's a source of fulfillment. It's escapism, interaction and community with other people who are friends that you're able to make and a source of achievement you're able to gain in your life. Even if these companies don't unemploy people, the only way for them to make up for this is to include all these costs upfront, which make an extremely high cost to people who want to buy the game. Thus, people who play this game purely for fun lose out because they cannot spend and do not have the ability to spend. And people who do things like buy upgrades have a higher cost because they now have to pay for everything rather than just specifically the one thing you want, lead to a much higher cost on their side of the house. Secondly, game developers have no incentive to update old games because there is no revenue stream that comes from in-game purchases. What this means is that games become a lot less accessible to poorer people who cannot afford to update their servers. If I'm playing Halo on an Xbox 360, on that side of the world, I'd have to upgrade and buy a PS5 in order to be able to now play that game because of the fact that there's no reason to do, even if I bought the game, there's no reason to update previous games. All of this just proves reduced access to all the benefits that gaming can provide and the wealth of happiness that it can bring people. For all of these reasons, we oppose. Thank you for that speech. We now welcome the second speaker of the talk. Um, just a second. Okay. Okay. I'll start my speech in three, two, one. Just to clarify a couple of things at this point in the debate. Firstly, what we are saying is we're not saying all games are going to be free. We think you'll still be able to choose whether to charge on your game or whether to have your game free. But secondly, we're not saying we are going to stop addiction. We're just saying the difference is our side of the world does not capitalize on this addiction to make money. I think an important thing to understand is that games are very addictive and Kausa already characterized that to you. We think free trials and games are not similar in any way. And the information there, slide already talks about you know a sizable portion of the game being availed we think being part of a game and having rank competing with your friends and whatnot is very different from watching one movie we don't think they can you know bring that sort of uh try to make those things seem like they're on the same level right firstly i'm going to talk about uh rebutting their case a couple of things that i talk about before i move into my substantive right so they bring this whole idea on accessibility and how they feel like they do it far much better in their side of the world we think it's okay in status quo this already exists for you to give me a reason to pay for something or a reason to buy something we think that's already okay but we think free game free games already exist in society so if you're going to talk about accessibility if i cannot buy something i will go for the alternative so if i cannot pay for this game i will you know access a free game and we think that's okay we think that's how status quo works right we don't think if you can't afford um you know this particular games that will change in, in you know in, in your size of in your side of the world we think you'll just be more likely to pay we think in your scenario you'll be more likely to trade off you know certain things that would be necessary for example buying books for school for you to you know pay for a particular game we think you're more likely to call us kids especially because that's you know the, the the target market when it comes to game to pay for this particular stuff and we think that's harmful right we think when you talk about removing bad parts of the game that that, that that's not what we are talking about in this debate right we I think the most important thing to understand, and we both concede to this, is that games are already addictive. So the problem in this debate is the fact that they are capitalizing on this addiction in order to make sure people will stay hooked and locked into the game and pay for those sort of upgrades that they wouldn't necessarily do if they were able to make rational decisions. Then when you talk about this whole idea on less information, we are saying that it's unjust to keep using a gamer's love for the game against them and using their irrationality against them. But even if this was not true, 
true. We think there's sniper wolf. We think there's game reviews. We think you can still be able to be objective on whether you're going to pay for something or not. And that becomes valuable. But even if that was not true, we think being able to rationally decide to play a game or not is the best side of the world where we're able to make you as objective as possible in how you're spending your money. And that becomes beneficial. On this whole idea on them, you know, hurting game developers and whatnot, we think firstly, competition is okay. We think that's how the market works. It's fine to have competition and for this competition to affect you. We think it just makes you want to have more quality. And we think production costs already go into the money that you charge anyway, so you still have profit. But even if that was not true, we think new companies are likely to make themselves free at first. And then after that, maybe later games, um, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll charge on later games. We think that they'd be more likely to do that. We see that in status quo when products keep getting expensive as, you know, they, people keep using them and quality increases. We think that's okay. But even if all that was not true, we think just by principle, you shouldn't use someone's addiction to make profit. We don't think you should defend such a world, right? I'm going to talk about a couple of things in my speech. I'll flag when I'll take any POIs. Firstly, rationality versus irrationality and how we promote that in our side of the world. Secondly, why... Um, inequality is not fair, then I will just uh, compare both worlds. Now, on this idea of rationality versus irrationality, we think other than, you know, people who have money, the more likely target market in ops world is those who don't have money, right? So they're going to buy into this free level, whatever, um, and just get into that world. We think this looks like, you know, the example I gave of choosing not to buy books or choosing not to buy things that you need in order to get a new character. A few reasons we think this is true. We think, firstly, Kaus already characterized the nature of the gaming industry and how, you know, the hook it has on its consumers. But second and most importantly, we think, and here is, the, you know, the scenario that we are trying to create. We think when you're already part of a game, because that's what happens when you play the, the beginning part of the game for free, you're already part of the game, you already have a rank, and you already have, so you, you're already actively participating in this game. We think there'd be more incentive for you to spend this money. That's why we are saying it's not fair for you to compare this to free trials in society. We think just the nature of the gaming industry makes that different, right? We think this is then compared to our where you have rational and objective decisions. We think you choose to pay for necessary things. We think I'd still choose to go on vacation just because that's quality that I'm willing to spend on. We think just being able to, to be objective like that becomes important. We think in our world, quality plays a bigger part because now the gamers, the producers, sorry, will want to have more quality games so they can have better buy-in or more people spend on these games. And we think that's okay. We feel like it's, it's, it's better than a world where they're depending on you to be hooked on this game for you to spend on this game. We think just by principle, that's not justified. We think then it's unlikely that the consumer can evidently quantify how much of an investment they're making in a game in their side of the world. We think if you're going to progressively keep paying for something, you're very unlikely to quantify how much you're spending. And because of that, you're very likely not going to make a rational objective decision, right? Because you're not going to know how much I'm spending on this game because all I want is to get a new costume, to get a new character. And we don't think that's valuable. I'll take any PI at this point. Would you ban in-game transactions that don't have an up in games that don't have an upfront cost? Sorry? Would you ban in-game transactions in games that are free to play because they don't have an upfront cost? I think having an upfront cost is better because then I actively make the decision to pay this upfront. I think at the point where I'm able to actively know I'm paying this amount of my money upfront, that becomes more valuable than progressively spending on something and I don't know how much I'm spending. Moving on to inequality in the games. We think if you pay for a game, you're still at the same level because you all pay. And we think if you don't pay for a game, you're still at the same level because it's free for everyone, right? So we think in those worlds, in one side, everyone who's playing this particular game has paid. And another side, everyone who's playing this particular game has not paid. We think at that point, we have equality. But in this particular world that OP is creating, we think the determining factor of success then becomes who has money and who doesn't have skill. And we think when we were brought for the info side, we were clearly told that we are talking about a sport and we need to understand that the most important thing to the gaming industry especially now when it's becoming a sport you know in the mainstream is to make competition fair in the best way possible and i think at the point where we are able to have hard work being the determining factor and not something like money because in their world the people who have the ability to access characters have the ability to access certain you know clothes and whatever then become the people who have the advantage and we think that's not valuable i think when we compare both worlds in our world we are able to 
protect consumers who become very vulnerable in this particular time, not only because they are kids, but because they're already hooked to these particular games and they're going to ask their parents for money. They're going to spend money on this game when they could have done other things or they could have been more rational in that decision they are making. We're not saying they shouldn't, you know, play video games we're just saying at the point where you're able to know i'm paying this much for a video game then that's what you're, you're making the active choice to spend that money and that's okay we think on their side they use the addiction of these people against them and that's already principally unjust but we think we think then quality stops being the determining factor easily because then what you're looking for is to get people hooked to your game so they can spend money and not necessarily having a good game and just don't think that's a valuable world thank you Thank you so much for that speech. We now welcome the second speaker of the opposition. Actually, I'm so sorry. I'm just going to go grab a sip of water. Just one second. Okay, I'm back. Second off, you're good to go when you're ready. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, I'll take POS in chat, please. Three areas of analysis in this speech. First, on whether a ban is justified. Secondly, on facilitating the development of the gaming industry. Thirdly, on increasing access to video games. First, on whether a ban is justified. Let's for a moment revisit the principle of side proposition. Their claim is this. Games are addictive because game, game developers are able to offer you a few levels that creates a dopamine rush, which means that you are coerced into buying the next few levels. Now let's take this analysis and see where else we can apply it. Let's imagine that Netflix offers me a free subscription, a trial for one month. And I enjoy using the service because I think that the interface is designed well, the content is something that I enjoy watching. After that one month has expired, I decide that based on my experiences with Netflix, I want to now pay for the service. But let's apply this even more broadly. If I buy any product, and that product creates a positive reaction because dopamine in my brain is um, something that is generated as a result of using that product. Would proposition claim that any company that creates a dopamine reaction in the minds of its consumers are somehow coercing us into giving up our money in order to facilitate the success of the company alone? The point that I'm trying to make is that their principle is not a principle against addiction. It's a principle that would prevent companies from being able to operate and sell their products to consumers on the basis that any way in which you improve a consumer's life by creating a dopamine rush is a form of coercion. The question in this debate is not whether or not these products create pleasure, because that is true of any successful product. The question in this debate is whether the threshold of addiction is so significant that this actually causes a tangible harm to consumers, which would justify the addiction being so great that the state ought to intervene to create a ban. We don't think that the addiction to video games is something that perversely hurts the quality of life of individuals. People don't spend exorbitant sums of money to the, uh, the vast majority of people don't spend exorbitant sums of money at the cost of things like their living expenses to pay for in-game purchases. And neither do we think that all companies are necessarily responsible for the addictive nature of consumers. Why is it that even the companies that are not intentionally trying to manipulate consumers, 
that haven't created a fundamentally addictive gaming interface ought to be punished by a punitive ban on all free to play games? These questions are still unclear to us. So that's the first response that I want to make, which is that the principle is inconsistent. The second response that I want to make is that this principle only applies in instances where the vast majority of free to play games actually restrict access to a few levels, as opposed to restricting access to things like cosmetic products, which don't have an effect on your actual gaming experience. I would point out that there are structural incentives not to want to limit access to the number of levels available, given that this is not the model that most free to play games use. Firstly, there's an incentive to maintain a large base of users, given that this is what you can use to market the game as being highly successful. Secondly, games with a larger user base are generally more competitive, and that is part of the appeal of many of these games. So you have an incentive to ensure that even if there are some power-ups or boosters that people can buy, that hard work can always compensate for that within the game itself. Thirdly, many games want to avoid the stigma of being pay to win, which means in general, the content overall and all the different game modes are accessible. It's largely things like cosmetics that people buy because they want greater social capital within the game or want to feel like a part of a unique clique of individuals who only have access to that content that, gaming, that the gaming industry and games developers rely on. The third response that I want to make is that their world is not one in which they improve the lives of addicted people. This is for two reasons. Firstly, their world is one in which games developers rely exclusively on pay to play games. This is far worse because on their side of the house, Based on their own principle, they also can't have things like demos for games, given that that would also be coercing consumers into buying the game itself. This means that on their side of the house, if I ever make the decision to pay for a game upfront, I do so with less information because I have never actually played even something that is a version of that game. This is far, far worse. If they claim that consumers are irrational, you can always become a more rational consumer and have and take greater control of that. What you can't account for is the fact that you have never played a game and don't have access to information in the first place. This is where things like the watchdogs debacle, for example, where pay to play games deliberately market themselves as being better than they actually are, become more likely in the world of the proposition because consumers have no information about the game that they are buying. It's entirely a speculative judgment that they make. Relying on reviewers as the previous speaker suggested is insufficient, given that we know that companies like Microsoft pay off reviewers like Kotaku to give their games positive reviews. Finally, I want to take them at their best. Let's concede that there's a small minority of people that are so addicted to this game that they're giving up large quantities of money to it. I would point out that this is not a this house prefers motion, which would change from the beginning of time, but a policy that the government implements in present. If currently you are somebody who is addicted to playing a MOBA, the likelihood is even after it becomes pay to play, you continue to pay the additional upfront cost because you are so addicted to the game that you have no option but to do so. So overnight, the costs to those that are addicted increase massively because they now need to pay for the complete game upfront. This also means that games developers have an incentive to further exploit the most addicted players because you, now you can no longer rely on casual consumers and players who only buy one or two cosmetic items because those people wouldn't want to pay the large upfront cost of the game itself. It means that the game design, the marketing of cosmetics becomes far more aggressive in the world of the proposition because you are relying on a smaller consumer base to pay you a higher quantity of money. And because you need to account for the lost consumers because casual gamers have exited the market. Finally, I want to weigh this. We think that there are intrinsic benefits from gaming, the sense of fulfillment that you get from achieving things within games, the escapism, the access to a wholesome community that many individuals use to make friends, and above all, the costs to the industry, the people whose lives depend upon being able to market free-to-play games and being able to develop those games, which they massively hurt. So even if there are a small minority of people who are addicted on a utilitarian basis, we prefer to prioritize the vast majority of people who benefit from the industry. Finally, on facilitating the development of the video games industry, they say that on their side of the house, they can maintain the longevity through play to play, uh, play to play pay to play games rather. Firstly, I would point out that this massively restricts your consumer base. You lose casual gamers and people that only buy a few cosmetic items. Thirdly, we think that there is no response as this is crippling to our argument about the growth of small games developers. These are the people who are most reliant on free to play games given that they do not have an established brand image. These people cannot find a way to pay for free to play games because they now also can't charge in game transaction. Finally, this leads me to the third and final area of response, which is also my substantive about reducing the quality of games. I would point out that there is no response to our arguments about access, but in addition, there's an exclusive benefit on our side of the house, which is that gaming culture becomes more equitable and less sexist. 
Historically, games have largely been marketed to male audiences, which, is, which has meant that over time, video games developers have become more sexist and video games have an incentive to appeal to the male case. This looks like the hypersexualization of female characters in many games, and also things like hostile chat rooms and video game chats that are explicitly sexist in the worst ways. Why do you think that the rise of free-to-play games reduces this sexism? Firstly, games developers have an incentive to broaden their audiences. They know that they are now no longer relying on just the small dedicated group of largely male gamers who are willing to pay for games, but also people who just casually game on their mobile phones, people who access free to play games because they recognize that they don't have to pay anything at all. This is more likely to mean a diversification of video game audiences, which means that the incentives of games developers become far, far better. There's a mainstreaming effect which increases the scrutiny on games developers, which means that more people are able to enjoy games where previously they were locked out due to sexist barriers. This is an additional part to victory because it means that games become less sexist and more enjoyable for more people, which leads to greater fulfillment. For all of these reasons, oppose. Thank you for that speech. Just give me one. Okay, thank you so much for that speech. And I welcome the third speaker of the proposition. Uh, could I just have a few more seconds to compile my notes? Thank you. Okay, um, <clears throat> I prefer to take my POIs verbally. I'm going to start my speech in three, two, one. Okay, so the opposition opened the argument by speaking of how important games are to society, how the emotional value behind games and the culture behind them really shapes how our society goes and looks at. Um, opening with how people playing the Minecraft theme song in WSDC was a really impactful and emotional moment. And we concede that we know that there is a value to games in the community around them, which is why we stand so passionately behind being for this motion and not and banning free to play games. Um, and certain arguments such as the exploitation of addicts um, and how this makes a Western environment later on, which we're going to get into our speech. What I'm going to justify to you is why our side wins and actually provides a better environment. Um, for gaming that actually stays true to that, those principles of equality that gaming needs for sports and just maintains that whole environment. So what I'm going to do in my argument is that I'm first going to be addressing some rebuttals, restoring the arguments that some of them I've tried to take down, and then I'll move on to my points of clash and analysis. So first on my rebuttals of the opposition's argument, um, the first thing that they brought up is that free-to-play games make it worse for people with addictions because now they have to pay up for cost. Um, which is higher for them. Um, the one thing that they really miss out is that they don't seem to understand in their argument how exactly addictions work and the logical link between um, how people getting a sizable access to the game in free to play leads to them getting a worse addiction. Um, the first, so to then make that connection for them, I'm going to compare it to alcoholism, which is an act also an addiction. It's that when someone who is an alcoholic who is chronically addicted to a certain thing gets a taste, then it's harder for them to avoid the second drink. And when they drink the second one, it's harder for them to avoid the third one. The thing, the case that we're making is that in the info side, it says that free to play games give a sizable portion of the game available to people. So now what this looks like for someone who's addicted is that they have a sizable portion available. This is different from a demo. 
because a demo does not give a sizable portion of the game. The reason that addictions are worse when free to play games is simply because of that one word, sizable. You give them more taste of the game, which leads them um, more into that trap of spending more money. Um, and why they actually do spend more money in these free to play games, so our second speaker brought up, is that it's harder to realize when you're spending money if you're spending it little by little. If you're only paying $20 for a skin once, um, $20 for this ability in the game, um, and you're doing that over a period of weeks, it's so much easier to far by far exceed the amount that you'd have spent if you're just doing it upfront. I'm going to pay $70 for this game. So overall, over longevity, it's a higher cost because it's harder to realize how much you're spending. One, because of the addiction, and two, because it's a more gradual one. I'll take my periods at the fifth minute. Um, so then now to build off of that, it's that um, on their second point, they said that gaming producers wouldn't be able to monetize their games enough um, if we buy. Do admit that core revenue, large, large amounts of revenue. But we believe that the reason we should ban this is because they do that in an unethical way. If we talk about the characterization of having people who or building off of people's addictions not being an important thing. One claim that they made in their argument is that these portion of people that are addicted under status quo are so insignificant, or at least in amount, that they should not be considered in this case, um, in this debate rather. And one thing that that view fails to realize is that that's simply not true. There's a really, really, really big issue about addiction to games. Um, and although not all cases are extreme, um, that level of addiction exists among a very, very large number of people. It may not be the majority, but the fact that that exists in a significant amount of people makes it very, very important for whoever to win this debate to prove that they cater to that group of people. Because although they might be a slight minority, upholding that for those people is more important because then you end up defending people who have a vulnerability um, versus the convenience and you know enjoyment of people who would have been perfectly fine otherwise. That's why it's more important for them to defend them in this debate. Um, so the first point I'm going to make on that is that free size of the yeah. only way games make revenue isn't by consumers paying them directly. You have things like ads and games, which actually tend to be the best way some games monetize them if they're free to play. And this is really common in the mobile game space, um, where you have games with ads. Um, and they are actually able to monetize themselves. And if you're looking at the small game developers that they were talking about earlier, if they do want to use this model, then it would be more practical and more ethical in this way to make a free game that has revenue through ads or through any other things such as sponsors, donations. Um, this is, having a free to play game isn't the only model of monetization, um, nor is it the most effective and for them to claim that it's the only way because it's an ethical, to play off of people's addictions, as we've already proved in our argument. And free to play games are still monetizable. And in addition to that, upfront payment games are still monetizable. A company is going to charge the amount that it needs to charge um, based off of how much it's spent developing a game. And the reason that this is, and one point that there is is that if we have people doing that always, it's always going to be more expensive and we're going to exclude a certain amount of people. And I'll get into accessibility later in my speech. Um, one way to mitigate that is that all games are still looking to have a high demand. If you're a gaming company, as of any company, you're still looking to have a high demand because high demand means higher profit. Um, it's a really impractical model, um, unless you're a luxury company, to have high demand or to have high prices and low demand. Um, so they're going to be incentivized to keep the game as possible, um, which aids in accessibility. So the first point, yeah, my first point in accessibility before I got into weighing, um, is that you still do have people and like more casual gamers being able to access this information. You look at things like YouTubers, casual gamers are still able to watch YouTubers that actually talk about those games and, you know, now make the decision based off of what they, they want to play it based off of the things that they hear. Um, and the second way is that casual gamers still have access to free to play games. We don't limit the information that they get on that. Um, Yes, so we don't restrict people from having information because this information is still available. We haven't restricted demos because demos don't give a sizable portion, as in the slide says, they give a little bit. So now on to weigh my argument. Um, I've already proven to you that one, we cater to people with addictions more because then to put them in this place where they're actually tasting what they're addicted to makes them more likely to spend at a larger rate because then 
they don't have that reasonability to see, okay, hey, I'm spending a thousand dollars in a year rather than me spending fifty dollars once in a year because I'm spending twenty dollars every week. Um, the reason that that's more important and that it's more important that we win on our catering to people with addiction is because of how vulnerable these people are. In the beginning, we characterize these people as being, you know, predominantly younger people who don't have as much income as those who are older. So it's more important for us to make sure that we create a society and a system in which that um, is upheld and that we just put them in the best position possible. Um, the second part is that the kind of environment that we create um, is really important. If we have pay to play games and there's kind of that distinction based off of how much money you have, then that kind of system that we we're talking about in the beginning where people um, are really into the culture of the game, that kind of starts to break down when you have this distinction based off of how much someone can play the game. Um, the reason that we win on that clash is because we maintain people being seen as being good at the game, not because they have money, but because they're just genuinely good. It better upholds that culture on the game, which is really important because then we're able to, we're able to maintain that really valuable thing that Oppo was talking about in the beginning. Um, yes, so we best provide for the gaming community. We think we win on that clash. Um, and it's more important that we win on accessibility as well because we still have people having this access to the information and being able to make more rational choices and we are the only side that provides rationality people being able to pay for these games thank you um that's my minutes thanks for that speech we now welcome the third speaker of the opposition hi just to check if i'm audible and visible yep awesome I just want to point out at the top of this speech that they have virtually no response to Chanidu's third argument and our argument on broad economic harms to individuals such as smaller developers. Now, maybe this isn't a big issue to Kenya, but I want you to weigh what these harms look like. Maybe on their best case, someone has to pay 10 extra dollars for a few levels in a game. But to a small developer, it's their entire livelihood and it's their job on the line if they don't get this and if they can't develop within the industry. So Prop 3 conceiving that maybe these economic harms may occur is pretty devastating to their case. Just because they don't engage with it doesn't mean this content is not important. I want to know that these are independent parts to victory by virtue of the fact that they are unresponded to. Two things I'll talk about in this speech. First, on addiction and why it gets worse in props world. Second, I'll talk to you about broader social impacts such as the economy and diversity. First, then, on addiction. I want to note that we have made the intuition pump as to why free-to-play games are like any other services companies provide you. I want to note then that the extra step I will take in this speech is pointing out that their argument is hung on consumers being able to be hyper-rational when it comes to purchasing games where you have to pay the upfront cost. Here's why this is not true. It's three reasons. First, in a world in which companies can't allow people to play a sizable portion of the game, they're more likely to turn towards exploitative advertising that hooks and reels people in. Like advertising does this for most products that are sold in the status quo, they needed to explain why they can't do it for games where you to pay the upfront cost. Second, reviews can easily be manipulated by companies. The point is, the moment at which a company's profits are reliant on everyone playing an upfront cost, that's when the incentive to manipulate people such as streamers, pay them to publish good reviews, exists and progresses within society. And to these individuals, it's probably very profitable to be paid by companies, given that they can give you mass amounts of revenue. But third, reviews are just insufficient because you may get mixed reviews. Like just because you listen to someone talk about how a game was, you can never gauge what that game was like for yourself, which is a reason as to why you want that experience by your own personal view, which is why reviews are insufficient for information. So I would note that people would still be addicted to games on their side of the house, but I'll prove why it becomes worse. So the thing they hang on, which is information, is insufficient. However, what is required to clean up this debate is a breakdown of the different types of stakeholders who pay free to play games. Three types of people. First, 
people who pay for some of the upgrades in the game. So you don't buy all the levels and all the skins, but you buy some of them. Second, people who pay for everything. But thirdly, people who just pay the, play the game and don't pay for anything. What I want to do before moving on to the analysis on each individual stakeholder is to frame that the upfront cost of a game is likely to be extremely high. This is because companies now give you the game at an upfront cost and give you access to all levels and skills and skins. But the aggregation of the individual costs that is required to produce those extra levels, those extra seasons of this Fortnite Battle Pass, the additional cost of all the skins that are made available with the upfront costs are all aggregated. And that is what you pay for in Proposition's world. So this is a massively high cost as opposed to the progressive one. And I'll deal with that a bit later. The response we hear in Prop 3 is there are other ways to monetize free to play games, free to pay games. That is advertisements. Two responses to this. First, companies wouldn't necessarily want to advertise on games where to, uh, on games where to pay the upfront cost because they're not sure whether consumers will buy these games given that the upfront cost is so high. But second, less people are going to play games if you're going to be spammed with ads every three minutes that you pay the, play the game. So it is either that companies have to cut down on the quality of games in order to make them affordable, or companies have to charge exorbitantly high prices for games. Based on that, let's move on to the stakeholder analysis. First, people who pay for everything within a game. I would note that this stakeholder is pretty symmetric, given that they would pay the upfront cost for this too. So all their harms in the most addicted also apply to their side. No response to this, by the way. Second, it's people who pay for nothing within the game because either they're rational and they just don't care to buy more things or they can't afford it. I would note that you completely lock these individuals out from paying the game, playing the game, when they have to pay the upfront cost as opposed to being able to just play the sizable portion of the game. This is where we directly engage with their argumentation on the skill versus money difference. Because for the people who rely on only skill, they can now not play the game at all versus being able to play the game on our side of the house. But finally, it's people who pay for some of the things within these games and upgrades as opposed to everything. I want to note that this is the majority stakeholder. Given that even if we want to buy everything within a game, there are other checks and balances within our life. For example, they say that a majority of stakeholders in this debate are children. Why parents are going to allow their child to pay an exorbitantly high progressive cost is extremely unclear to me. Why the other checks and influences you have in your life, such so as the tangible harm you feel from going hungry if you buy a skin instead of eating lunch or dinner, is also a check within your life. I would note that on our side, people who pay for some of the upgrades within games have the choice as to what upgrades they want to pay for. In opposition's world, they have to buy literally every single thing that is the aggregate of the upfront cost. However, Let's assume that addiction exists in our world and is such a prevalent issue like opposition makes it out to be. What I want to note is that addiction becomes far worse on the side of the house. First, individuals who are already addicted, given that it is an implementation of the motion, will have to pay upfront costs. But the second, it's that but the second thing I want to note is that. Uh, producers now want to exploit individuals who are already addicted because casual gamers will move away from the game because they don't want to pay the exorbitantly high upfront cost. This is analysis Chanidu gave you that they never responded to. So for example, increasing the prices of games because you know that the most addicted will always buy them is exploitation that happens in their world. Never ever responded to this analysis, even though we bought it up in second and that is crippling to that case. The second clash then is on broad economic harms. But before that, I'll take that POI. Don't you think you're likely to spend more money in your world and even worse, you won't know you're spending more money? I've already given the analysis as to why you have the choice of how much money you want to spend in our world versus having to pay the entire upfront cost of every upgrade in the game. Second thing then on broader economic and social harms. Look, no response to Chanidu's third argument on women and the reduction in sexism within games. I want to note that that still stands. However, 
Two reasons as to why the gaming development and world is harmed. First, less people can play free to play games because they can't afford the exorbitant upfront cost, but they can afford to play a sizable portion of the game or pay for some upgrades. So less people participate in free to play games. But second is if companies try to make it affordable, they have to cut down on quality and people don't want to play, you know, extremely bad games. It's the same reason why I'm okay with playing Fortnite because I can play a sizable version of the game as opposed to like Subway, which is completely completely costless and a pretty bad game. I would note then that all our argumentation on how you heard esports development comes into play. First, small developers who can't rely on the existing popularity free to play game, uh, free to play games, free to play rather help. I would note then that our argumentation on how big companies like Epic Games unemploy people to make up the loss in consumers also exists. For all these reasons, given that they haven't responded to our macroeconomic harms and our social harms opposed. Thank you for that speech. We now welcome the opposition reply speaker. Uh, can I be heard? So I'm going to start this reply by analyzing different paths to victory for the opposition in this debate. But first I'll look at the proposition's paths to victory. The proposition mainly in this debate has one path to victory. To prove that the rate of addiction or possibility of addiction is extremely high. And therefore this meets the threshold for a ban. We on opposition strategically proved that we have multiple paths to victory. We can either prove that the rate of addiction or the threshold of addiction isn't such that it meets the, the quantity required for a ban. Two, we can prove that this creates other active harms to industries and people that far outweigh any harm of addiction, even if it does occur. And three, we can prove that we on our side are the only side that can actively make the gaming industry better by proving the importance of free to play games. And I'm gonna go through those one by one. So firstly, in terms of dealing with this idea of addiction and why it doesn't meet the threshold for ban, the main way in which we analyze whether or not something meets a threshold for a ban is by looking at other instances and comparing it to other products. Here's where our intuition pumps and our comparison to things like Netflix and free testing comes into play because it was there that we proved that their principle is not a consistent one. And even if it is consistent, isn't enough to apply to this instance because simply because something produces a dopamine rush isn't enough to prove that it is a level of addiction worthy of being able to restrict people from accessing that kind of game at all. For this reason, on even if you are able to prove that there is some degree of addiction, that addiction isn't up to the threshold where we're able to say that the state is justified in intervening. So it's one path to victory that takes out the proposition's path to victory. I understand why that might not be sufficient, uh, that might not be enough, even if sufficient to neutralize this debate to give it to the opposition. So here's the other path to victory that we need for us. The first is that we flipped their argumentation on addiction and proved why these companies become more exploitative on their side. Exploitative advertising, easily manipulating uh, people who do things like stream and review. The fact that reviews are insufficient all show that on their side of the house, you have less information about this and thus make less of an informed choice. And therefore it is more unjust to ban than not to ban. And who made analysis using the analysis we gave early on stakeholders is important here because the biggest harm then is that you lock out people who are poor from being able to play these games at all and restrict them from any sort of happiness that these games could provide them, which is a unique harm. For people who buy some of the upgrades, we've proven that on their side, they'll have to pay out a much higher cost. And for these people, it is simply not worth it. All of this then proves that the people who you care about in this debate, people who play these games, as per their analysis of caring for these addicted people, have it much, much worse off because either they have to pay upfront or these companies increase prices, proving that things get worse off. But extraneous to anything on addiction, we have unique paths to victory that win this for us. 
first in terms of why their side of the house makes it much worse for women gamers or women in the industry generally because of chani do's analysis on how you shrink the view, the consumer base to a point where you just keep relying on previous consumer bases that are entirely male a unique part to victory that relies that stands in this debate completely unresponded to that we can use to win secondly the fact that the gaming world is worse off because these companies now have a less substantial form of income because of my analysis in first that was still unresponded to as to why the pay to play model is isn't as profitable and as a result you are more likely to either cut down on quality or lay people off both of which are worse thirdly the fact that you heard esports development and shun this growing industry that is giving rise to incomes for a large number of people and ruining their lives we think all of these parts to victory prove that maybe even if we have to buy some degree of addiction that addiction is not worth the huge cost that comes to all these people that have their livelihoods dependent on this industry that they take away on side proposition for all of these reasons free to play games have to say for my sanctity and for the sanctity of the gaming world entirely thank you for that speech and to close the debate we welcome the proposition to apply speaker All right, just to confirm audibility, visibility. Great, let me set up this timer. Cool. Starting in three, two, one. Panel, when I began my speech from the first and from the get go, I gave you the most important clash. The clash was whether a progressive cost on playing games versus an initial cost or even like literally no charge at all for a particular game would either be justified or would either have a lot of harms, right? Then I think those two strains came down to the idea of sort of um, having two actors here. Those, those are the consumers and these small developers that later came into the debate where we were talking about accessibility versus addiction, then we have profit and longevity, right? Those all play into the goals of these industries. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you exactly what proposition case looks like and how, even if we use just the first speech and the material you gave from the first two substantive speeches, it is enough to rebuttal the whole of our bench, right? Firstly, when we come to tell you, we heavily analyze why there's a necessity to actually ban these games, right? We give you three very important points. Firstly, we tell you other alternatives do exist, and that is the model, right? Either you don't pay anything for a game and you can still play these games, right? Or secondly, if the game is of higher quality or something that is trending and essentially requires you to pay an upfront cost, you can pay the upfront cost, right? Then the clash points came in here when they started talking about the fact that if you start paying an upfront cost, it's essentially going to be so much more expensive. You're not going to have accessibility and suddenly a very ridiculous analysis of the idea of you know desexualization that actually comes with a free to play let me point out firstly the idea of having a free to play game in of itself from the name itself is clickbait because it's not supposed to be free to play it's free to play to a certain level or for some you know for some users because at one point you do have in app purchases you do have to upgrade to a certain degree in order to become competitive and actually start earning off the game right but even secondly here we already talked to you about the idea of equalization if you have costless games then there are their analysis on accessibility and representation is literally thrown out of the debate because essentially you're not paying any cost and you can still access these games right but even if we take their best case which we did from the second speech right we told you even if you have an upfront cost why essentially was that important michelle talks to you about the idea and that comparative of a progressive cost versus the initial cost and also links that to my speech where i talked to you about the rationality of these consumers which brings me to the second point where we're talking about these consumers being able to make the right decision I need to remind the panel that from the first speech, I gave you a discrepancy that there is absolute choice and then there is relative choice. When you have the free to play uh, free to play games, you essentially just have relative choice. That means you do coerce in somewhat way, even through playing three levels or having in-app purchases or play to or play to win or whatever kind, you are coercing these users. What we tell you on our side, our side is when you have this absolute choice, even if you have very limited information, we think we bite the bullet and say that is fine, but at least you know that you're not 
you're not necessarily addicted to this game and you're still able to decide whether or not you want to play, right? Which essentially then points out the inconsistency and logical flow in their case. They come and tell you that at a point where you have costless games or you have to pay upfront, essentially then you hurt small developers. Panel, if people are not able to pay or are not able to pay uh, the free to play games, right? When you reach level three and you're supposed to make an in-app purchase and you're unable to do that, then that is the same metric that will apply if you can't pay for the upfront games, right? So there's no, no correlation on the idea of inaccessibility because at the end, on both sides of the house, you do need to spend money. The clash becomes whether you spend it initially or progressively. And we already point out to you the harms of actually paying it progressively, right? But then even later, later on, we give you a very a huge distinction on the idea of having demos on that sizable portion of the game, right? We already tell you that at the end of the day, from our side, it is so much logical to either have it cost less or have that initial payment because at the end of the day, those benefit both the consumers and ensure absolute profit to these small developers, something that on the comparative does not even compare. Thank you. Thank you so much for that speech. Thanks everyone for the debate.